brief history of Norway. This uh, monument uh, sort of shows it all. It's on the way to Roros in Norway, which I visited with my host. So the attack was absolutely a big surprise, um, very well coordinated. So Oslo, Trondheim, Bergen, Stavanger, and other places uh, were all attacked all at once. And in Trondheim, my, uh, my friend, one of my interviewees, he said, you know, I was a carpenter and I was a journey carpenter and I was on my way to work and there were all these soldiers hanging around on the, on the dock and he had no clue who they were. And these photographs are from April 9th. Uh, the, the Germans have arrived in uh, Trondheim and people are going like, well, oh, what is this? It was just a total surprise. So uh, the same day, the leader of the National Sondling, Norway's um, pro-Nazi party, Quisling, met with Hitler uh, earlier in December in 1939. And then in uh, the, uh, 1940, like just days before the invasion, he was ordered to Copenhagen uh, to meet with Nazi intelligence agents. And a lot of stuff wasn't known at the time. It came out, I think, in the trial. Back in Norway, he's back there in April 6. At 7.30 in the evening, he got on the radio and proclaimed himself the new government as prime minister. Of course, King Hawken uh, rejected this plan uh, for the new government. He had already fled Oslo and was on his way to um, head of the troops. Meanwhile, Hawken is, they've gone north and then they're pushing up through the center of the Germans. They pretty well have overwhelmed all the ports by this time. So the fighting is going on in the interior Although later the uh, British and French will come in, Poles will come in and try to stop the advance. But on the way up, there's a lot of damage going on. Um, this is on the way to uh, Roros. The Germans are pushing through the center of the country and the devastation as mentioned earlier was terrible. And um, it took a while, uh, actually some right away, the news information got out almost immediately on the wire. So in May, um, this was a, published in the uh, Illustrated London showing the damage that was done. This is in uh, Namso and this other one is, uh, these are both Namso and um, another area. But the one I found intriguing is that actually the same month Life Magazine also showed how the, um, the action in Norway was published in their uh, magazine, I think in April, 1940. And it's several pages I have, uh, I found this at our local archives. So the last stand is the allies and British and Poles, they fight against alongside the Norwegians and Narvik. But then they had to withdraw to go back and protect their own countries. So June 10th, it's over, Norway is occupied. So what was life under German occupation? This is Trondheim on the, uh, the old bridge that goes into the center uh, where Nidros Cathedral is and all that. And um, immediately, uh, Joseph Terboven is arriving in Norway. He's coming here on April 24th. He's a per personal friend of Hitler and he was brutal. He had a, even though he's not in charge of running the civilian side, uh, he had all these, um, men and including the secret police. Quisling uh, was, well, he found out he was not effective. So he was kind of pushed aside, but he will become prime minister in 1941. So right behind the troops comes the Gestapo. This is uh, Victoria Teresa in, in Oslo. And this became the main headquarters. But this photo on the right shows German soldiers arriving on April 9th. They are taking over the Phoenix Hotel in Trondheim, and eventually they will also take over the Mission Hotel, which was a horrible place. Uh, they tortured people there and all that. And it really shows for Trondheim, it was very strategic. They really wanted this area. It's a beautiful area. It's the bas uh, bread basket of the area. And of course, major um, U-boat pens were, were built. The Tirpitz was here and many other uh, warships that would go out and attack these convoys that, that was talked about earlier. So what it was like for ordinary people? Well, right away, you couldn't sing the national anthem or fly the flag of Norway. You had to have passes to move from one to place. This included an ID card. And if you might be in a mountain area, you might have a specific pass that would allow you to go in there. In addition, anyone with a disability, such as deafness, you needed a medical card. 
for exemption from an opposed labor project. And what that means is that this gentleman that I interviewed, he said, you know, in Trondheim, they put these lists up and it's like for 16 to 65 year old men, you had to go look at those lists. And if you didn't show up, you would be in trouble. In fact, he got in trouble because one of his last jobs, which was about January of 45, it was to build a building that had four walls. Three of them were wood, the fourth was concrete. And he knew that was going to be something for uh, killing people. So he left and got away from Trondheim and eventually got it over into Sweden, which is another long story. Uh, radios are con you know, they're collected immediately, newspapers, um, could only carry NS News and many of the newspapers just quit. They were not going to do this. And any kind of broadcast from BBC or underground newspapers, you could be put to death. English and American movies, plays and books were forbidden. And spot checks could be set up anytime. They check for your ID. You're coming off the ferry and you have to show your ID when you come off the ferry. You can be arrested anytime. <clears throat> Also uh, for ordinary people, immediately, you know, you have this long coastline in Norway and fishing is extremely important, but they imposed a 50 mile limit under the pain of death. You had to carry this poster in your, your fishing boat and rationing was very strict right off the bat. There were cards for sugar, coffee, all the way to bicycle power. And their women complained of, you know, they didn't have regular cloth. Sometimes it was made of cellulose, which really crinkled. And I guess it smelled bad too. So um, these are some examples of different um, things. This is people lining up in Oslo for uh, rations. So part of this immediately, you know, the National Songling was only a couple hundred people, but by the fall of 1940, you had 22,000 people that belonged to this. And these are the uniforms of the Hirden. This is the young girls version of it. And we've got them marching. I believe this is Oslo. They had their own newspaper, the Frit Folk. Uh, in 1941, the Brickshire, they were just called herd mostly, uh, was given police powers. And then eventually they were armed. And often they uh, guarded prisoners in concentration camps and on the Swedish border. So in the first fall, the crackdown on labor unions began. A couple of labor unions leaders were executed. The students at the university rebelled and so the society was shut down. All the sporting organizations were notified and of course no one would show up. You wouldn't dare go watch a soccer match, uh, you know, something that was done by the National Sommeling and which really irritated people. And the rationing got worse. Henry Oliver Rennie, you cannot, I focused on him. Uh, he was from the North, but he's very strategic for going after uh, all the resistance group. He was recruited very early on, even though he shot, uh, he worked in the, uh, drove a truck, I think, in the Norwegian army during the initial invasion. And he ran a torture chamber in Trondheim called the Cloister. Over a thousand British agents and US things went through it until liberation. It was absolutely horror, horror place. His group had, sad thing, he had 70 male and female Norwegian agents on his payroll of 75,000 a year. And then he would bring in what he called negative agents. These are innocent Norwegians who actually thought they were working for the resistance and what they were doing was betraying their, their friends and neighbors. And he was Norway's number two war criminal after Quisling. He personally killed 13 people. Of course, right away, right as soon as the army was no longer fighting against the Germans, the resistance began. And it was organized in uh, the military organization, it was Milorg. And uh, you'll see the Lev uh, Honken 7 up there at the top, that became a symbol of freedom. Sivorg, it was the civilian side of it, the churches, the schools, and different civilian part of, of they found different ways to. Um, to uh, resist, but in a different kind of way, not militarily. XU was the uh, intelligence op branch and they worked closely with, uh, initially on their own, then eventually with the British. SEO Norway was developed, um, SIS. Uh, these were all intelligent units and also commando units that came. And export was another piece. Um, this is part, I think, of Milord, but they helped people like the sled picture at the top, get people out of Norway. One of my favorite ones I love, I mean, the heavy water thing is thrilling, but I, I'm so in love with the Shetland bus. It's an amazing thing. And one of the mistakes that um, 
that the Germans made is that all the fishing fleets were out. They'd already gone out to sea when they were invaded and they had planned on you know, taking all the major boats. Many of them just went straight to uh, you know, Newfoundland or they went all the way to, uh, you know, to Baltimore and to New York harbors and refused to return back. So the bus actually started right away. It was originally a little fishing boat like the thing at the top. That's the Arthur, it was very famous in the early years. Um, by about 1943, uh, the Germans were really catching on to what was going on. So they introduced the um, submarine chasers. They were given three of them, the Norwegian government, the Hesse, the Vigra, and the, um, oh, just went out of my head, the Hitra. This is the Hitra now, and that's another amazing story you need to find out about because they restored it and you can take tours on it now. They, they would only were working above, I would say above Christiansen, I don't think they went really far south. They were going all the way up past Monso and uh, you, you different sounds there, but this is sort of the, um, the way, um, the different tours that they did coming to Uppsala. Uh, radio operators were very important, um, extremely dangerous job. And they were trained in Scotland and then either parachuted in by, um, by free plane or you'd come over by the Shetland bus. And uh, one of the fun things is that most of the agents uh, had names named after ro rodents. And someone said that, you know, like a lemming, that would be their code name. But they said, thank God I wasn't uh, in the Netherlands because I would be a vegetable. Um, the illegal press also started up right away. And uh, these are all done on mimeograph. And I remember this from, you know, elementary school, the smell of the ink of the mimeograph thing. And uh, these papers are actually in the Resistance Museum in Oslo. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. They also have children's things in here too that I found uh, just fascinating. Uh, but they would get the word off the BBC and type it up and then send it out. Extremely dangerous work. And I love this shot. This was smuggled out, but this is another way civilians could um, you know, do a little bit of um, protesting themselves. Uh, the other thing was using paper clips. We hang together uh, was one of the symbols and there are different ways that ordinary people could do. Uh, they rested a lot of people initially that first summer, but they didn't really establish any kind of concentration camps until 1941. False Dodd was built next, I mean, sorry, Greeny was built next to a woman's prison and then expanded into these barracks. And False Dodd uh, was, which is north of uh, Trondheim, uh, is, uh, was established then in a place that had been a boys reformatory. And I had a chance to visit this place. It's very moving. It's now a place for peace and resolution. But I got to talk to people around the area whose parents either were there or they had someone who knew someone who uh, lived in the village. So 42, like I said, there's hard things happening. 42 was the worst year I think in Norway. Uh, you still have the diminishing supplies of, you know, rations and all that. But this is a time when many of the Mila groups were exposed in what they call a roll-up. Uh, re many resistance leaders were arrested, jails executed. The underground papers were exposed and people were arrested, jailed, and executed. Um, some of the political prisoners were at Greeny. Some of them, were, they were going to think about sending them over to um, Germany. Also during this time, the teachers strike. It's an amazing story. Uh, an edict went out, you're gonna to have to notify the schools. Uh, up to 10,000 signed a paper. That should be 10,000, not 100,000. Uh, they signed up to saying they were refused. So they arrested male teachers. Many were sent to Greeny, had a very difficult time. The fascinating thing is the resistance continued to pay the salaries. And then eventually, because people were being so, you know, really tough about it, they sent teachers up to Kirkenes, um, where very hard labor went on. People heard about it, the word got out in Norway, and they were, um, they were greeted as the train went north. And eventually someone in Sweden picked it up in a newspaper in Sweden. And once the world found out about it, um, it they won. And they were back to teaching without Nazi doctrine. Uh, another thing that's going on in March 42, Article 2 against the Jews in Norway. They had a very small number of Jews, about 2,100. In uh, August, Quisling gave a speech saying, you know, Norway's right place in the world will be, 
but it'll be Germany's victory over Jewry. And uh, this was a chapter that's not followed so much, but uh, one thing I discovered in Trondheim, little Stubelstein, these little uh, bronze plaques put in front of a house on the hill going up there, I think it was in Rosenberg, where a family had lived and they had been sent to Auschwitz and died. And it's a project that's going all over Germany, Norway, and other occupied countries. Another piece was the Televog. So Televog is an island on an island south of Bergen. Uh, it was a great landing place for SCOE's uh, Shetland bus. And there was a, a shootout between two agents that were discovered and uh, Gestapo and the Gestapo men were killed. So Terboven made it sure that the people would remember this. They were getting you know, people were not doing what they were supposed to do. You've got teachers rebelling and you've got all this stuff going on. And so they raised the whole entire village. They burned up all the boats. They separated the men that's 16 to 65 and sent them all over to Germany. Uh, the women were separated and put on boats. The children for a while were separated from their parents. It was called the Lydice of the North. And it was followed um, uh, in the American uh, newspapers, which I thought was interesting. Another thing that's really more coming to light now is the massacre of two and 88 Yugoslav POWs at Biesfjord, I think is how you say it. And uh, it was a death camp up there. And these men had been brought over from uh, Yugoslavia and sent to work on railroads and barracks in Northern Norway. And they were ex executed by their guards. Uh, they were herd members. And uh, the atrocity was hu hushed down, but the museum up there in Narvik is wanting seriously to talk about this. The other thing that happened is that Trondheim was kind of like a little rebellious place. And because uh, they had these important U-boat bases there, but people were not, you know, they were kind of going about their daily days, but uh, they finally, there was a big uh, sabotage. So Terboven uh, had, I think initially there's 24 picked, 10 were, taken up, uh, arrested, taken up to the Falstead Forest and uh, executed. And Terboven came up on a train, they had a big party and I was talking to the Justice Museum. Um, he's a police advisor there. He said, yeah, they all got drunk. It's just horrible. And additional 34 were executed over the next couple of days. Going there to Falstad was one of the most moving things I think I've done. This is next to the concentration camp. And you walk through the walk to the forest and you see these little ovalists. They're marking probably, you know, 20 to 40 people in one, one grave. Uh, then in 1942, in the November, uh, Norwegians were rounded up in Oslo and sent to gas chambers. Of people that were in the middle of the country, they ended up in Falstad and were shot in the forest. And a total of seven, 172 Norwegians went away. This is what's interesting on the left. Uh, what I found fascinating is that the Royal Norwegian Information Service was very active and they would get word out and put it into their local newspaper. So this is quite a detailed thing about how uh, they were arrested and uh, sent out. So the news happened in uh, you know, the 26th, but it's being reported December 4th in the uh, News of Norway letter that went out, put out by the office there. Uh, as we get winding down, jumping to 44, uh, they had a Quisling called up young men born 21, 22, and 23 for Norway's labor service or AT. He wanted to get 70,000. And the big fear was that they would be sent to Germany to fight. And so one of the things that happened, uh, the Norwegians said, get out of there. And in just in Oslo alone, 3,000 went up into the forest thousands throughout. And then a problem happened because at the time the ration card was given to the family. So trying to um, <clears throat> bring these kids in, you had to go get your own personal uh, ration card instead of the family getting it. And of course, what do you do? You're going to starve the guests in the woods. So a big issue was how are we going to um, do this? And um, eventually there is a sabotage rage in which they blew up ration cards. But um, it was quite a difficult decision for the resistance, how we we're going to feed them. So as we near the end, uh, for ordinary people, they were so excited when Paris fell. They thought they would be free. And uh, in some ways, some of the <clears throat> resistance groups got a, what my dad would say a little frisky and were taking risks. And uh, that was not a good idea. 
uh, because they're going to be held to, as you know, May 8th is when, uh, when capitulation happened. During this time in November, uh, the, the Germans are being chased by the Russian army into Northern Norway. Most of the resistance in the South didn't quite know about it. There were rumors about it, but it was for several months that they didn't really know what was happening up there. And the for food shortages were very critical. There was a group called the Danish Relief that helped during winter, actually the Norwegian church. I know the, um, the Deaf Church in, Nor in Oslo hid a lot of the food behind the altar. And uh, you can see a button down at the right, which is um, from the US group, um, which was started up in 1940 to get rations to, to Norway. So things are really critical. And despite the fall of Paris, and Allied gains, you know, uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, then the push came. They're really, the Allies are really pushing. The Gestapo and uh, the state police were really vicious in Norway. So finally, liberation came in late April 1945, you know, after the death of Hitler. But the big question was, you had 360,000 well-armed Germans in control of Norway. And there was a fear that they could go on for another six months. They also had 20,000, 40,000 Russian POWs. And it's like, would the Allies have to go fight there? It was just a huge question. But fortunately, everyone sat down and agreed. And you know, I talk. 